take care of those who have mental health problems without putting the money there to help those who <coughs> are in the community who we have taken out of the facilities, put on the streets. We don't provide the mental health locally in the community. We're not putting the reimbursement in for the doctors so that they can get the insurance. And how do we actually address the problem? Those are the persons who we need to take care of. This bill doesn't address any of that. And what it does do is make it so people will be less likely to come and seek mental health care for nonviolent if they're going to lose a civil right, which is the right to self-defense. Sure. Th thank you for the question. First, on the, on the funding issues, um, I think Maryland has one of the strongest community mental health systems in the country, and the governor's budget this year actually does include additional funding, including for psychiatrists. But second of all, as I mentioned in my testimony, there will be additional funding in the supplemental budget that, that speaks to the issue of community services. To, to your second question um, about uh, the voluntary admissions, one of the things that I said is that uh, the administration is supportive of what passed the Senate, which took out that voluntary admission um, route and replaced it with people who are um, subject to emergency petition, um, which is not a voluntary uh, process. So uh, understanding your point there, I think there, uh, what passed the Senate actually um, doesn't include that uh, provision. So, uh, and that's something that, that the administration would be comfortable with. I would also point out that, and I should have mentioned this earlier, that both the proposal in front of you and the bill that passed the Senate have a restoration process. So anybody who um, would, would, would lose their uh, gun possession ability would have the ability uh, with a, a, a doctor's note and um, you know, a review of their uh, history to be able to just get, you know, get off the list. So I think that um, both because of the fact that, that there's another uh, set of amendments that could address your issue and the restoration process, I think that's how we think that through. take care of that because my understanding is this bill currently says that if you seek voluntary uh, entrance into a mental health facility for a non-violent... Uh, no, the, the current bill actually doesn't change existing law. Well, you, you, the, the Senate bill does. The, the, there's an existing law which is 30 days in a psychiatric institution. You're talking about involuntary. I'm talking about voluntary. No, I'm talking about voluntary. The only route in... The, the, there's a route in existing law 30 days voluntary is a prohibition in existing state law. The, what we put in the bill initially left that alone, and anything that we added was involuntary. There was no additional voluntary a path. Then what the Senate did is they took out the existing law provision on 30 days voluntary, and they kept in our involuntary, and they added this additional part of the involuntary system. So the, the version that passed the Senate would, I think, be the closest to addressing your concern. If your concern is you don't want to see any pure voluntary path, they took that out in the, in the Senate. And that's something that we're comfortable with. I want to see no pro, nothing that keeps people who have non-violent tendencies but have mental health problems from going to seek help through a mental health professional because the punishment would be you would lose the civil right. Uh, you know, I, I, I totally understand that concern. I think we're trying to find a place to, to draw the line where we're focused on the dangerousness issue and that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're trying not to keep people from seeking treatment. And so we've been trying to find the right place to draw the line. The Senate did draw it in a way, I think, more consistent with what you're asking. So you'd be amenable to any amendment that would achieve that purpose? We'd have to look at a particular amendment, but I would, you know, certainly the one that passed the Senate, we were comfortable with. Thank you. Thank All right, thank you very much, this, this panel. Thank you very much. Now we'll get to one hour of the opponent. Please come forward, please. The opponents of the bill. Can we charge? Let's uh, bring up Patrick uh, Shomo, Mark Pennick, John Jocelyn, Shannon Alford, Richard. Kuzman and Kirk McWilliams.
Good afternoon. Ms. Alford, would you like to begin, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Shannon Alford. I am the Maryland State Liaison for the National Rifle Association Institute for Legislative Action, and I am grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today regarding the legislation before you. Now, there are multiple bills before the committee. I will confine the bulk of my remarks to the governor's proposed legislation. My uh, written testimony reflects the NRA's position on House Bill 294 as it appears before you in its current posture. Um, I also intended my remarks to address potential amendments that uh, either were presented and adopted in the Senate or the House may consider making to the legislation. The bill, as proposed, contains significant infringements on the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding Maryland citizens. Conforming the feature test to the 1994 federal ban on so-called assault weapons would not make it acceptable. As long as the governor continues to support removing from the market choices available to law-abiding citizens, commonly owned semi-automatic firearms, the NRA will continue to oppose his efforts to do so. As many of you know and have experienced for yourselves, these firearms fire only one round with each pull of the trigger. While we appreciated the Senate's decision to remove thumb hole stocks from the feature test, we would continue to point out that all of the features described in the proposed legislation are simply accessories. They do nothing whatsoever to enhance the lethality, power, or rate of fire of the firearm in question. We would appreciate a clarification that a person whose legally possessed semi-automatic firearm is grandfathered under the terms of this legislation, that they may in fact transport that firearm to and from the shooting range, hunting field, or gunsmith. But the fact remains that the person who wishes to do so must register that firearm with the state police within a set amount of time or face heavy penalties, including fines or possibly jail time, despite a legitimate reason for failing to do so. Also, I would point out that criminals not only won't register their guns, in fact, the Supreme Court has told us that they don't have to, lest they incriminate themselves and violate their Fifth Amendment rights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 10-gram capacity, despite the fact that many commonly owned firearms have a standard capacity of 13 to 17 rounds of small caliber ammunition. Americans as a whole own tens of millions of magazines with a greater capacity than 10 rounds, a criminal determined to have them could get them from purchase out of state or outright theft. Our law enforcement officers carry more than 10 rounds of ammunition as a part of their regular duty gear to defend themselves against the same criminals that Maryland citizens must defend themselves against. And the Maryland citizen in that same scenario is in fact the first responder to a crime perpetrated against their person or family. And those brave members of law enforcement <laughs> Amendments might reduce the fee for a handgun license and reduce the required number of training hours and expand the categories of persons who are not required to take the mandatory training course. But fundamentally, it is wrong for the state of Maryland to require a license for the exercise of a fundamental right. A criminal does not ask permission before he attacks your family. A Maryland citizen should not be required to ask permission from the state before she defends them. This legislation attempts to address a problem which doesn't exist. According to FBI Uniform Crime Reports, the nation's total violent crime rate peaked in 1991 and has decreased by 49% to a 41-year low, including a drop in the nation's murder rate to a 48-year low. At the same time, according to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the number of the most popular firearm classified in this legislation is a so-called assault weapon. The AR-15 semi-automatic <coughs> rifle has risen by 3.5 million. The number of semi-automatic firearms in general has risen by about 50 million, and the total number of privately owned firearms has risen over 120 million. According to Maryland State Police records, nearly 47,000 firearms of the type banned under this bill are owned by Maryland residents. Since 2004, again according to FBI Uniform Crime Reports, 